Hello everyone, today we talk about Byzantine military tents from the 6th century. You would say, what, what the hell, right? You know, a bit of camp life from, from this time for the sake of completeness. It would be probably better explained by an archaeologist with some kind of uh, further um, historiographical background on this topic. Uh, I suspect that m most of what we will see today is valid for an important amount of centuries after the 6th that we basically concentrate in this series on Roman warfare as basically you know, and completely arbitrarily the end like kind of the Roman army uh, focus we, we make. As you know, we make videos actually also on all the rest of Byzantine warfare, so this is not the problem. This is just a bit more of an in-depth thing, and that's why we talk about such things uh, incidentally. Uh, and it's important also to to realize certain aspects of the military economy, if you want, you know, in the form of also space. I don't know if you ever calculated the, the surface of um, of a military camp, right? The needs properly for for men to and, and animals to to deploy in an orderly way for uh, also for the sake of redeployment, as we will see, but also to maintain the place as hygienic as possible, because that was uh, actually a, an enormous concern. Things didn't really change much uh, historically, right? The way the encampments are, like in surface, are similar, at least for the amount of men uh, specifically. Um, and it, it's also about considering how these people properly lived in the camp and, and as, as, as units. Right, and especially the ones that shared the same tent that were the troops that in battle also fought basically close to each other so they had this closer bond as they shared fundamentally life on, on their arms. Um, so it was considered, in fact, essential that the men belonging to a same decarchy, so we're talking about ten men, uh, would be um, lodged in the same or at least in two tents that... Um, are known as Kenai in, in Greek, this time uh, in order to develop a strong uh, esprit de corps. Mm -hmm. So the tents were naturally not disposed randomly, but according to the order that the uh, respective uh, decarchies preserved in the battle formation, so that the men could deploy rapidly in case of necessity. We made some videos on the uh, early uh, Roman uh, camps and how properly the the lodgings were systematized for for the main purpose of redeployment, right? For for sortie for, for defending the camp and so on. So here it functioned basically in the same way. There is this idea that you know discipline was some time loser at this time. Um, it's possible in general, but we shouldn't exceed like you know the, the disciplinary standards are maybe you know, lower when also there is less of an intense warfare here. That by the 6th century, uh, properly the amount of troops of, 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 of the empire, same width of the empire had d decreased, but um, also demographic resources had become more precious, also the economical ones, so this means actually a greater care for detail, as in, in many things, like in the 6th century and in also in previous times, later on times, it's it's usually... That are, there's usually overlooked is is how much actually the, the, you know technological imp implementation was carried on because um, essentially they were trying to economize at best with the best means that before they would just you know employ en masse without much with other concerns that weren't about specifically the detail right and this may be the case also for tents actually uh, because um, as we will see, the, also the specific type of tent had changed I historically. Uh, Procopius describes the tent not made of hides, but by a, essentially a fabric, a rough fabric known as sindon in Greek. And he uh, employs the same Latin term papilio, from which the term pavillon will uh, derive. Right, it was used uh, by uh, ancient literature and becoming fundamentally standard, as you know, in medieval sources, also in the West, etc., to describe this this type of tent that had, you see here from uh, mostly used later Byzantine manuscripts, um, like the Skeletitis, the, the the you know more or less the the the, the form, the shape, the, the the properly the construction seems to have remained the same, and 
these tents were thus prevalently circular in form. They were rather wide uh, and, uh, you know, with, with a lot of room. Uh, and by imitation of those introduced by the others, and in fact they are advised in Strategicon 1, uh, 2, uh, which considers them, quote, practical and elegant, as it's in fact evident from the illuminations uh, made in manuscripts of later, of later centuries, and we find them, by the way, used, as we've seen, in the same way also by other peoples, right? In the same Byzantine manuals you find, I don't know, the, the Muslims using the, these things. Um, as you know, also the medieval tents in Western Europe were, were fundamentally looking quite uh, quite the same. The Paris Strategicus lists a series of practical recommendations that have to do with the management and the organization of the tents specifically. The provisions had to be placed at the center of the tent mm -hmm. um, so that it would be of easier access for everybody fundamentally equally. Um, and the lances had to be fundamentally planted at the feet um, uh, of the of the soldiers' beds. And the reason why they were planted on, on fixed on the ground is that for saving space fundamentally, and for this purpose also the shields were leaning against them, with the concavities uh, turning uh, towards the uh, the spear, so that the soldiers that could thus embrace them rapidly um, in uh, in case of need. And here there is the, also the disposition. I don't remember here. Uh, you, you will find it in in the images of, of of soldiers in the tent. It was fundamentally circular one. So basically the heads were disposed, uh, you know, close to the perimeter, uh, and uh, the feet uh, towards the center. The center there were, there were the provisions. Uh, the uh, as we will see now, also armaments were deployed in a specific, uh, on, uh, basically on the on the left. Of, of the soldier um, to to maximize or not to to hamper each other when they were you know arming themselves, the diameter of these tents seemed to have been um, uh, roughly you know fifteen twenty Roman feet at this point so um, was enough right to to maintain you know certain commodity certain space uh, within the, the same tent uh, naturally. Soldiers, as far as I understand, slept on the ground, right? You know, their beds were like, you know, what they they created there. Um, and uh, but you know, maybe something more constructed, maybe temporarily, was was surely used. Officers surely had their beds, and things like that, or at least they were more likely to. So the rest of personal equipment, as we were saying, was placed on the left. Of the bed, so this would allow to respect the right order in the vestition, and probably with the aim of carrying it out with rapidity and method, if necessary, also in the dark. Right? I remember when I spent some very brief time in military academy, I was making my own bed, you know, uh, and I didn't think that you know in the row that were the other the other guy doing it from that side so basically we, we we banked against each other because I had passed from from the the wrong side whereas I could have made the bet only from one and in fact it was clumsy about that so these problems are real because it's not much matter of um, you know uh, I don't think this ness well okay altogether can't create disorder right uh, especially in, in conditions of emergency you have to have these reflexes to, to know exactly how to move mechanically but that is also part of a broader psychological need for unity for order for control in the routine right so it's very important also to stimulate the spirit of corp knowing how to do things all alike like all the others gives you this sense of uniformity of belonging to the group and being a functional element of the same um, so in the order, the soldiers that had to uh, clothe and to arm themselves uh, first using uh, putting their shoes, then eventually the greaves, uh, the belt, the cuirass, the helm. Finally, the swords, the bow, uh, and arrows with protection for the arms, um, etc. Uh, so this could take uh, time, as you understand. And every tent had to have a sentinel. That means one of the guys was was awake, right? Not just 
while the other slept, not just to prevent uh, theft, but especially to prepare better the men uh, to to cope, you know, to to react to the enemy, right? Uh, because naturally these tents were, you know, deployed place all together with some kind of uh, protection seen the strategic and the Romans as the Persians uh, regularly had um, camp uh, fortifications um, but naturally you know having someone the awake is just also psychologically reassuring for the others they probably made a rota system so that you know they would sleep maybe just that they would stay awake maybe just uh, some some hour and then going to bed so they would at least have some some rest for that night all together um but uh, the um so having somebody awake there was properly saying what the hell is going on around right uh, there was always some part of the army awake that was guarding all together right and seeing whether something was wrong or simply maybe without awaking the others it could you know ask for information to to the guys in front of the other tents or something and uh, the officers could also you know refer some message in that regard uh, etc and then these aspects are important because they uh, this as as we know moral forces the psychological dimension plays an enormous part altogether so mm, it gave a sense of secu security right of protection saying there was somebody watching over uh, those who slept um, and uh, given uh, you know the camp management altogether already in the Codex Theodosianus, uh, as we know, uh, eventually incorporated in the Justinian one, um, there were some very detailed military laws that reported the most different recommendations, uh, some of which are, you know, some even weird in a sense. For example, in the case of encampment. Uh, next to the a river bank, right? There is a very curious uh, rule that prohibited to pollute its waters and to uh, essentially uh, undress in in view of uh, of the public. This is the uh, Codex Juris uh, Civilis twelve thirty five twelve, for example. Now, as strange as can sound, let's make some hypothesis here. You see. Um, as we were saying before, hygienic problems were very important, right? So you're talking, we, we never talked actually about the, the the proper need, especially of water, right? And how much in certain areas, right? Also, you have, it has to be current water, right? And uh, so polluting the waters is, is something, you know, mostly difficult to not to do when you have great masses of troops, um, in general, and when you know that you have to get rid fundamentally of all uh, the impurities through uh, through water at the same time, it has also ver to be very very close to to a river in the first place. So uh, the rest of this law is not entirely clear. I mean, it's obvious that sometimes you know it depends. Like if it's a it's a pool, a, a lake, something you know, the water is more stagnating. You should avoid maybe to to pollute it if people drink from there, which is kind of obvious. Right, but you know, in the case of a river specifically like this, well, it, it depends, right? Probably there were certain kinds of, you know, areas that were deputed for eliminating uh, the impurities that were downstream, whereas you know, upstream people would drink, uh, the, the animals would drink. So we we don't get much information about these things in general from medieval sources, but it, it's kind of obvious. It's still, the need of water is is enormous. Enormous. It's something incredible. If you if you look just at the tons and tons of water, you, you even wonder how they factually made it to to use it right for for all the needs. Right. If you just uh, consider the cooking ones, for example, not even cleaning them yourself, but properly just for the for the kitchen, it, it's something insane, insane. And for the horses, you know, let's not even talk about that. Um, and this thing also of you know undressing themselves and clothing themselves. Uh, away hopefully from 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 the public as a as, you know, as an injunction is uh, also like what the hell <laughs> right of course people cared about uh decency about you know the, the, considered that the, the the legal code naturally expresses a sort of broader we said it in the series about medieval laws or sort of perpetua sanctio where these norms were not 
ex exclusively practical. It doesn't mean that they, they didn't have a purpose, right? But they all, they were also speaking about the decency, the decorum, the image, right? So maybe yes, undressing in front of, of others in a uh, to to avoid excesses of you know kind of uh, machistic uh, bravados and things like that. It might have been okay. Let's keep that under control. It might have been a disciplinary measure, right? Maybe they didn't care much about being naked or less. But, uh, you know, it might have been part in integrating part of a broader disciplinary issue, which, however, we made a video actually about 16th century Roman army discipline. We have seen that it buried somehow and that sometimes people that even committed much worse uh, acts, even in combat, right, were, you know, got away with that by a certain degree. So, um, it's not easy to to determine what the single norm sometimes is addressed to, like in, in positive practical terms. At the same time, it's it's nice to notice, and uh, it, it it's still part of that culture, etc. And th this is literally it. I mean, there isn't probably uh, more than much about surely about yeah the textile construction, all these things. As I was saying, I'm no expert about that. I don't even know whether we have a concrete. Uh, probably, yeah, th there was some archaeological find of sort, but, you know, it also not descriptive of the entirety, um, of, of the entire set of tents we used at the time. You can imagine naturally also different different types, like uh, uh, an army on, on campaign is like, not, people sometimes don't even have clothes um, like lasting, right, on campus, so you can imagine tents. Part of the reason why this Sindon, as we've seen, was very, you know, made of a robust material, because naturally it had to also prevent from, I don't know, if it rained, it had to, to avoid it, this, uh, the water pouring uh, inside of these things, but um, so it, it might have been more uh, resistant, specifically, than, um, than, than other uh, fiber. I don't know how it was made of concretely but it's all I mean it's logic it's obvious right and um, and other things but f f f the same goes for the shapes right there were probably many different ones according to the situation there were surely some fortune shelters derived from other I mean troops could be built in uh, in the people's uh, houses huts, things like these um, there might have been even I don't know caves literally um, and consider always one thing is the the army, the encampment, thousands of, of, of soldiers, you know, well served logistically, etc. That you know, replicate this uh, this position uh, that here on paper should be perfect in everything. But um, what, what but that maintains in those situations a, a, kind of, a certain kind of collective standard. Whereas you see, you know, certain detachments, explorers. Smaller units, garrisons, whatever they they would have adapted themselves to the situation, like you know the military is 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 meant to to do uh, all the time, given the precarity of the situations they find themselves in, uh, with v very poor resources. Because as we've seen, banally also at this point, materials were were a big deal, right? These were times in which not even armor was so frequent because it costed too much. They had literally wood. Uh, plates uh, sometimes so instead of armor um, so you can imagine properly even finding certain uh, fabrics, certain uh, texts, like, well, was a big deal right, was uh, you know, was important it was, here we see this step's influence from the others that bring in some, some solutions that probably were more practical because as nomadic peoples they, they were much more out there under the weather than than others, so probably their solutions regarding uh, lodging, stands, things were somewhat um, more more effective economically wise. Incidentally, we were talking the other day about the uh, about our warfare from the strategic, and that points out how uh, we were pointing out ourselves actually how much they they economized themselves on how careful they were about their own resources. So that model might have not been random at all. Right, whereas sedentary populations had a higher surplus, they tended to 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 waste more, right, just by uh, by by standard by default. Um, but that's pretty much it. Also, the internal disposition, as we've seen, illogical is coherent. Um, so yeah, and probably 
I, I don't know whether we will ever talk again about this. We surely do for previous uh, Roman times, uh, because things changed um, over time. As we've seen, heights were apparently not uh, that common anymore, but we're still there for sure. And anyhow, for today we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.